Welcome back to another installment of Good Design, Bad Design, where we look at how games approach graphic design. While there's a lot of overlap between the two, good graphic design isn't exactly the same as good art. Good graphic design covers things like menus, UI, camera work, color choice, font choice, animation, character design, the presentation of information. We have six more examples today, and while some of these examples get into concepts that are connected to each other, they aren't strictly paired up. Also, remember that beautiful games can have bad graphic design, and vice versa. Games with bad graphic design aren't necessarily bad games, but good graphic design can help make a good game into a great one. Okay, let's begin. Good Design It's been years since we had a flood of game series making the jump from 2D to 3D but it's easy to forget how important that period of gaming history was. So much of what we think of as standard in today's games was first designed in that era. There are a select few games that stand out as the best of the best in 2D to 3D conversion. Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, and I'd argue Metroid Prime belongs right next to them. The beauty of Metroid Prime's 3D adaptation is not just that it kept the classic structure and exploration intact, it's in how it kept the same atmosphere and sense of isolation that makes up Metroid's identity. To maintain the atmosphere, the designers at Retro Studios had to make some big changes. 3D could let them make a stronger connection between the player and Samus, but they would need to overhaul how the game was presented. They had to put the player into Samus' shoes, or more accurately, her head. Metroid Prime's helmet HUD is more immersive than the HUD of the 2D Metroid games. It still shows all the same info from the 2D games, energy meters, missile ammunition, and maps, but now it adds new elements like lock-on indicators, hazard meters, weapons, visors, and radar. Elements that feel like what Samus would actually use, building that information right into her visor. The new visor framing lets the designers add some interesting mechanics too. After taking some… weird input from Miyamoto, Retro added things like the x-ray and thermal filters, and then used them for puzzle solving. The filters wouldn't have made sense without the first-person view and visor framing, but they also added another layer to the environments and the feeling of a more realistic space for Samus to travel through. The visor scanner was new too, and gave a nice new way to show optional gameplay tips and storytelling. There are so many other little touches that strengthen the connection between the player and the character. Lots of these techniques are common now, but for the time it was a real step forward in immersion. Flashes of light will reveal the reflection of Samus' eyes, the way the helmet slightly shifts as you look around, the alien splatter from exploding enemies, the electrical interference from taking damage, the raindrops that increase in frequency as you look up in the rain. The line between the player and Samus is blurred, done as realistically as they could with the hardware of the day, and the change in perspective immerses Metroid Prime's players in the same atmosphere, and sense of isolation that made the series a classic in the first place. Bad design. So, Hover was a thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Hover Revolt of Gamers. Mm. Hover is a multiplayer focused open world parkour game that was pitched as a spiritual successor to Jet Set Radio. It's got the premise, art style, and music to match. But the UI design is... <sighs> Hover's UI design is impractical and sloppy. There are big, sweeping problems with almost every element in your HUD. The objective list only shows three and a half objectives, and you can't choose which objectives to track like in, say, Borderlands, or most other quest-driven games. There's a crazy taxi-style waypoint arrow that points towards either your next objective or the nearest quest giver and it can flip-flop between the two at a moment's notice, and there's no way to lock it to an objective or waypoint. There are things like the chat log and player list that don't need to be on screen all the time, but they are. All of these text boxes aren't scrollable without pausing the game, and it's pretty clunky to take up screen space all the time just to see the last thing someone said. Then there's the area map that's hands down one of the worst maps I've ever seen. Just look at it. There's no detail. Only a few of the landmarks are shown with these city walls at the edge of the map and these two highway roads. These other signs don't really tell you anything and with the world's vertical design, it's hard to tell where the quest givers actually are. Inside each UI element is another problem. 
Hover uses a tiny, crowded font in different backgrounds that make the game's text difficult to read. Here's a quick typography lesson. There are three main kinds of spacing. There's kerning, the spacing between a pair of letters. There's tracking, which is the letter spacing applied evenly to a group of letters. And there's letting, which is the vertical spacing between lines of text. A graphic designer can adjust these properties for different stylistic effects, and it's a subtle part of what makes good and readable typography. But you can royally screw it up too. Hover's text tracking and letting are both uncomfortably close. The font they use throughout the game has some weird design choices for some of the letter shapes. The R and S are tiny, the O, A, and even G could easily be mistaken for each other, the cramped typeface doesn't match well with the game's tone, and was clearly designed around the PC. The type is the same on the console versions, where there have been tons of complaints about how small the type is, especially on the Switch. The header typefaces in the other UI elements also have sloppy typesetting and placement. The hard-to-read font is then put on a semi-transparent background, which makes it even harder to read, especially when it covers the glowing game environments. Yes, you can get used to the interface, but one of the points of good design is to get information to someone easily. Hover's UI makes it tougher to play the game, and there's no good reason that that should be the case. But even if Hover has some major problems, at least it gave the world a couple new Hideki Naganuma tracks. Ah, maybe Hover's not so bad. Ugh, never mind. Good design. Journey was a major influence for me wanting to study graphic design. It's masterful in its minimalistic storytelling, and that minimalism bleeds into all of Journey's design. Journey has no traditional UI, but there's one piece that helps drive its players through the game in a way that works perfectly with its narrative. I'm talking about the scarf. Love that scarf. Hidden throughout Journey are these ancient glyphs that, when collected, magically transform into an elegant red and orange scarf. The scarf pattern represents energy that allows you to jump. As you jump, your energy depletes and is only refilled by touching other pieces of fabric, like these bridges, cloth creatures, or another player. As you go through the game and find more of these symbols, the scarf expands and so does your energy. Find enough symbols and you're basically able to fly. You don't actually need a long scarf to finish Journey, but it gorgeously flows in the wind and the jump feels so empowering. The scarf is valuable for the mechanics it provides, but Journey is a game about meeting random people and helping each other through the experience. Without words or numbers or titles, the scarf becomes a symbol for a player's experience in the game. Jumping could have just been tied to a stamina or MP bar in the corner, but by making it part of your character, it connects the player to the narrative and is a starting point for random players online to form a bond with each other. The hidden glyphs give you a reason to explore and to cooperate, with the more experienced players guiding newer ones to the glyphs, all just for a bigger scarf. Without words and without a traditional interface, Journey's designers give an item that feels like a gift and a reward. The presentation of Journey's scarf is a lovely design and is part of the foundation of an ambitious, wordless narrative. Bad design. Video games have a quirk that makes them trickier to design. The fun of a game often comes from overcoming a challenge, but for single-player games, a game designer has to design both the problem and the solution. They create the villain and the hero, the burning hospital and the fire hose. Wait, this makes game design sound like an extortion racket. Huh. Anyway, the tricky part is in the balance. If the problem overwhelms the tools used to solve it, the game becomes frustrating. If the solution is overpowered, the game can become boring. It's easy to think of something like an overpowered weapon or a broken magic spell that can upset the balance of a game. But it's not just a problem for systems based around numbers. Overpowered tools can also compromise other elements of a game's design, like its UI and art direction. A perfect example of this shows up with Detective Vision in Batman Arkham Asylum. Detective Vision is a visual filter that lets players get a clear view of the environment, highlighting the location and status of enemies and key interactables through walls. It's incredibly useful. In fact, I'd argue that it's almost too useful. 
There are no gameplay downsides to flipping it on, and there's nothing that keeps you from using it all the time. Many players develop a reliance on the tool because without it, they feel blind. Without it, enemies and objects are so much harder to see and track. Players rarely turn the mode off in order to keep that sense of tactical control over the situation. It fits Batman's style, but you are looking at the game through an ugly filter that hurts the game's presentation and atmosphere. Rocksteady tried to tweak the later Arkham games by obscuring even more of your surroundings. They wanted to encourage players to toggle Detective Vision off, but it was still just too useful, and a lot of players kept using it as a crutch. Batman isn't the only game with something like Detective Vision. Similar visual filters in other games are pretty divisive among fans. Some see it as a lazy way to bypass environmental design issues. It's a patch over a common problem for games with more realistic art styles. Key objects can blend into the environment, and it can be tough to know what you can interact with. This, without a highlight, is very easy to miss. Some games like Insomniac Spider-Man strike a better balance visually by showing the information you get from a detective vision mode without covering up the rest of the picture. It's another tough balance to strike, and there are no straightforward answers or even universally loved ones, but at the very least, Useful interface tools like Detective Vision shouldn't obscure a game's art direction. Good Design Top tier visual novels like Ace Attorney, Doki Doki Literature Club, Danganronpa, or Supergiant Games' Pyre live and die on how they tell their stories. I like Pyre's fantasy basketball element, but I think the game is at its best during the downtime between matches where you're learning more about the downside and its residents. The way Pyre presents its backstory is excellent, with its gorgeous typography and artwork, but also with the subtle decisions that Supergiant has made to make the reading experience feel effortless. The best visual novels, like the best stories, reveal themselves at an even rate, fast enough to keep your interest and in bite-sized pieces to not overwhelm readers. Visual novels only have a few tools to use to pace the game, their story is primarily told through their text boxes, and one of the ways to affect pacing is through the line length inside those text boxes. According to Joseph Humphrey, a UX designer at the game developer Inkle, as a rule of thumb, the optimal line length should be about 5 to 15 words per line to keep the dialogue from feeling too long-winded or too wordy. Shorter dialogue chunks work great with Pyre's emotive character portraits. It's not a technique unique to Pyre, but the shorter text segments let the character expressions change more frequently and let little visual flares punctuate specific moments of the story with much more precision. Having longer text chunks would make these expressions a little clunkier, with either a longer wait for a tone change or a disconnect between the emotions being shown in the portrait and the emotions in the text. Pyre also does a great job with describing people, places, things, and concepts with highlighted keywords. Hover over these highlighted words to get a deeper explanation without an immersion-breaking script change where the characters explain concepts they would naturally know about. It's also a great way to help people who might have put the game down for a while get back up to speed quickly without having to detour to a long encyclopedia entry or story recap. The rollover boxes are used for non-dialogue information too. Rolling over the environment shows flavor text and extra details describing what your characters are doing. It's not plot-critical stuff, so making the player seek out that information specifically is a good idea. But making it still easy to access is a stylish and elegant way to present all the little details that make Pyre a vibrant world. Bad design. Pop quiz. Can you spot the UI problems in Gunnir? I bet you can. Ready? Go. Did you see the problem? Was it everything? Gungnir has one of the busiest, most disjointed, unintuitive, and intimidating interfaces that I've ever seen. Gungnir is a fine enough strategy RPG up there with Final Fantasy Tactics and Disgaea, 
but the UI just leaves an awful first impression that makes everything seem more complicated than it really is, and scares away potential players. We could just nitpick parts of the design, and we will, but Gung Yir's core problem is that it has some horrendous visual hierarchy. Visual hierarchy is all about arranging your content in a way that implies the importance of each piece. A well-designed hierarchy makes information more organized and digestible. Fonts, type sizes, and compositions can be tweaked to help naturally lead the player's eye around the screen to give them a better understanding of what's important and what's not as important. This upgrade screen from Moonlighter has a nice hierarchy. The player's options on the left are the most prominent elements, followed by the upgrade description on the right which leads your eye from top to bottom with an image of the upgrade, the upgrade title, the price, and a detailed description. Simple and easy to read. You know where to look. Gungnir's the opposite. It floods you with information, and while most of it does matter, there's no clear pattern to why the information is laid out as it is, and there's tons of conflicting signals and redundancies that clutter up the screen. It takes more than a few seconds to really know what you're looking at. Gungnir's tutorials could have helped clear things up, but they only do so much to teach you what all of the game's elements mean. There are so many systems at play here, and if they're all screaming for your attention, it gets bewildering very quickly. I think Gungnir was going for style, but you can't create much of a style by just flooding the screen with as many elements as you can think of. Look at something as simple as the opening battle screen that gives you the conditions for victory and defeat. Here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 13 different type treatments here. Elements that should be grouped together are styled in a way that separates them and everything is misaligned. It's just basic win-lose conditions, there doesn't need to be this much text. The character stats screen has tons of pointless infographics that are less clear than a simple numbered stat. You seriously do not need these bars or arrows here. Gungnir is a prime example of why graphic design matters in games. The busy and convoluted nature of the interface is a wall that will inevitably turn some people away, and those who can look past it still have to work around it. Good graphic design can be subtle and sometimes hard to nail down, but it's something worth studying and something that all games can use to put their best foot forward.